everyone. Welcome to Liz Collin Reports, where we talk truth and have meaningful Minnesota conversations. On the podcast, a Minnesota woman who considers herself a patient advocate, fighting corporate profit as a pharmaceutical drug safety advocate. We've all watched that profit piece play out in the last couple of years through COVID care and vaccine mandates. But Kim Witzak's fight began long before the virus took hold of our everyday lives. Kim joins me now. She's my guest for the podcast this week. Thank you, Kim, for being here. Great. Thanks for having me. Alpha News has done a lot of reporting on the vaccine injured, where I know a lot of your efforts are now. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But as I mentioned, your fight for safety, sadly, began a long time ago. It was the death death of your husband, his suicide, that put you on this path as an accidental advocate, as you call yourself. I never in a million years would have set out to do this advocacy work, but sometimes our like greatest purposes um, choose us. And it started a long time ago, um, almost it was 19 years ago on August 6, 2003. Uh, my husband of almost 10 years was found dead hanging from the rafters of our garage at age 37. Woody wasn't depressed. He had no history of depression or any other mental illness. He had just started his dream job with a startup company and was having trouble sleeping, which is not uncommon for entrepreneurs. Um, But he was a guy that needed eight hours of sleep and he trusted his doctor because, you know, his doctors have put him, as I like to say, Humpty Dumpty back together from all his sports injuries over the years. So he went into his general practitioner and um, left with a three-week sample pack of Zoloft, which is um, an antidepressant for insomnia. And I wasn't home the first three weeks he was put on the drug. I was actually out of town for business. And I will never forget when I came back um, after the three weeks, um, he dropped his back, his bag at the back door, completely drenched through his blue dress shirt, fell to the floor with like his hands around his um, head like a vice. Kim, you got to help me. I don't know what's happening. My head's outside my body looking in. You got to help me. He's bawling. And I remember like sitting there. I didn't even know what to do. And, and you know, first calmed him down, got him to stop um, just this, I mean, crying. And um, we did breathing, praying, and eventually called um, his doctor and told him about what what happened. And the doctor said, you got to give it four to six weeks to kick in. And every day, the next week of his life, he came home and he'd be like, what do you think about acupuncture? I'm going to beat this feeling in my head. Everything was beat this feeling in his head. So when I got the dreaded call from my dad, I was um, out of town again for, I'm a producer um, for an ad agency. And I got, um, I talked to the coroner and the coroner wanted to know if he was on any medication. And the only medication he was taking was Zoloft and it was sitting on the kitchen counter. And I remember her saying, we're going to take it with us. It might have something to do with his death. And the other thing that was interesting that day that Woody was found is the front page of our local newspaper, the Star Tribune had an article that said the UK finds link between antidepressants and suicide in teens. So that in, um, that was Woody's note because he didn't leave a note. And so that almost, those two pieces of information and the the fact that how did Woody, this guy who loved life, take his own life? And so that became kind of the battle where it all, um, that was the, you know, the point where it all started. And I haven't stopped in 19 years. And how did someone like you, which I'm sure is part of the equation too, not have any idea of this risk? And you mentioned you're then on this tireless journey, Kim, to help get the suicide warning labels on antidepressants. And that was no easy task. No, I look back and I think, well, so I'll never forget my brother-in-law Googled Zoloft and suicide the night that Woody was found. And he saw that the FDA had hearings in 1991 when it was just Prozac on the market. And they were looking at um, the link between violence and suicide. And every one of those advisory board members, a committee that I sit on today, for um, said that take money from pharma, said, nope, we don't see any link. And at that time, the FDA said um, to Eli Lilly, you need to study suicidality. 
the, they never did. The FDA never followed up. And meanwhile, we now have more drugs, um, antidepressants. Um, we have Paxil and Zoloft that got put on the market and approved for kids. And there was no warning. And I remember that being like literally almost instantly getting on a plane. I don't know how many times I've been out there and would meet with members of Congress, um, FDA, HHS, the media. I had a lawsuit um, against um, against Pfizer, a wrongful death, death and failure to warn lawsuit. A lawsuit where you were able to discover through depositions and paperwork about what the company knew and what they weren't telling the rest of us. Absolutely. So, you know, this was all the, the stuff, the documents, and there was one that they had that was really personal to me because it was one where somebody was writing into Pfizer's chief medical officer talking about um, patients that um, on 50 milligrams, which is what Woody was on, and I was told that that's very low, um, were telling that they were outside their bodies looking in. And the, they wrote by, back to them, oh, it happens on all SSRIs. We don't know why. And I was like, wait. Why wouldn't you tell doctors? Why wouldn't you tell patients? Why wouldn't you put warnings on? And of course, it's very similar to what we've heard on all the drug issues of warnings. Like, well, if you put a warning on it, people might not take it. I'm like, uh, that's exactly the reason you should be telling somebody. So if somebody like Woody, um, or you think about if they were actually getting it for depression, that if they start having these like out of body experiences or, or and abnormal things that aren't normal, you would have a chance to go, I think it might be the drug. And, you know, here um, I have binders of documents that I marched out. And these are documents that um, are not, not my story. They're not many of the other, um, as I call them, acceptable collateral damage stories. These are FDA documents. These are Pfizer documents, and these are um, other drug companies. Like, I was shocked to learn in Germany originally didn't approve Prozac, while the FDA did, um, back in the 80s for two reasons, risk of suicide and lack of efficacy. And that was in the 80s. And so this, all of this information that was discovered, it's too late for me um, and our family, but it became like my mission that we get um, warnings put on these drugs and and put and keep the pressure on the FDA and you know and to get Congress involved to start investigating the link between companies and academia and so it was a whole different time period. Looking back, uh, you know that, that was what in the mid two thousands. And we'll get to the parallels today because I think they they can't be ignored. But again, this huge systematic problem. Uh, when it comes to just how, how bad this is. And on your website, it's kimwitzak.com, so W-I-T-C-Z-A-K.com. It says, front and center, the fourth leading cause of death in the U.S. isn't a disease. Taking medications as prescribed kills 128,000 Americans every year. But I know beyond Zoloft, you worked on other drugs, and you've, you've mentioned that important role with the FDA you also have and with this career that has helped you with, with the messaging and to get people's attention. Yes. Um, so, you know, I look back, I have a very interesting kind of lens through which I approach my drug safety. You know, not only do I have the personal experience of what happened to Woody and discovering it through the lawsuit and, and all of my political experience, but I now sit on um, the FDA uh, Psychopharmologic Drugs Advisory Board um, as the consumer representative re representing the public. So I see what's happening to the drugs that are coming onto market. Um, and they're all being, a lot of them are being fast tracked. And so that's one, one lens. The other is I've spent my entire career in advertising and marketing. So I understand that, you know, a lot of what we're seeing, especially we're the only, um, besides New Zealand, we're the only other country in the world that, uh, allows drug ads and to directly to consumers. And so I understand the game of messaging and I understand, you know, like the power of hope, selling hope and selling fear and, and the fact that, you know, through what I learned through the lawsuits and working with a bunch of lawyers is one of the first places they love to go when they get into a drug company file is marketing. And so you'd wonder like, so anyways, that's, all of how I've um, viewed and, and, you know, at the time 
I started going out to DC and I really thought it truly in my life, uh, in my world, I thought, oh, this must just be an issue with antidepressants. And I didn't realize that it's actually a problem with our whole drug safety systemic problem, you know, from conflicts of interest to um, the role of like ghostwriting and pharma is involved in almost every aspect, which is, I call it the invisible spider web of where the doctor and patients don't necessarily understand mm-hmm. It. But some of the other drugs that I've been involved in uh, before or after Zoloft and before now doing some of the COVID vaccines is, you know, there were Seroquel. They were trying to get Seroquel, which is an antipsychotic approved for um, depression, first line treatment of depression. Well, I know that there were all kinds of issues with the initial clinical trials for the approval. So I just kept on, you know, I'd go to those hearings and at least voice concern of the everyday um, person um, and why it matters. Chantex, um, which is the smoking cessation drug created by Pfizer. Well, interestingly, that is one where um, the FDA actually, in an unprecedented um, move, actually removed a black box um, warning, which black box warnings are the most serious warnings that a drug can have. That means that there's deaths associated with it or serious, serious harms. And Chantex had all sorts of over 2,700 lawsuits and they settled, Pfizer settled it for millions and millions of dollars. But as part of that, they um, silenced and gagged every one of the victims and um, that they could never tell their story in public again, nor if there were people that were advocates like me that had websites and they had to remove their websites and take them down. That After all of that was done, Pfizer goes to the FDA with this new study that they did in Europe saying, oh, see, there are no um, psychiatric side effects, which is vi- which is violence, um, hallucinations, delusions. Um, and the and so I was pretty excited because I was like thinking I'm going to be on that committee now that gets to say, hey, I have a question. Why aren't where are the victims and the, um, the lawyers and the experts that reviewed the data? I want to hear from them because. We should want to hear all information before removing a warning. Well, I, a couple of days before the hearing, I actually got kicked off the committee. Um, Pfizer brought it to their attention, and I was told that I had an intellectual bias, and I didn't even know what that meant. Um, and so I asked, you know, I was uh, it was a room full of FDA officials, and I remember asking, um, uh, like, if you consider safety an intellectual bias. I will always have an intellectual bias because safety um, has to be for, you know, it has to be in the forefront. Um, And that is what we're learning is, you know, most people don't look at safety until after the fact. Nevertheless, um, I still showed up at that hearing on my own dime and wanted to make sure that I at least asked that question to my fellow board members. Um, But the unfortunate part is, if it's not in the, if it's not part of the official government record, um, my questions, which is really what I wanted. But it is so shocking just to hear the secrecy uh, and and the levels you've had had to pull back. Um, and on that note, you're currently working, I know Kim, on a docu series that's in development right now called Selling Sickness. We're going to show our viewers a clip, and then we'll go ahead and talk about it. So here that is. I knew something was wrong. We have given over to the world's second biggest industry, pharmaceuticals, the power over our health. Do we need a pill for every ill or have we been duped by science? Healthcare is big business and we're the customers. We are 5% of the world's population and yet we take 75% of all pharmaceutical drugs. So there is this follow the money aspect to the program, but what can people expect in this docu-series and what is the goal here, Kim? Well, the goal is really selling sickness is, I always say healthcare is big business and we're customers. And so it's really, you know, the um, docu-series is going to be through this lens of marketing and how industry has been in every aspect. Like, you know, um, patient safety or, you know, when you have these disease awareness groups like National Alliance for Mentally Ill, the American Heart Society, when you start looking at them, when you think that they actually are advocating for patients and for uh, they're actually to go look at their funders, 
their some of their biggest fundraisers and um, funding comes comes from pharmaceutical industries. So then it's talking about um, it's connecting the dots. It's the um, ghostwriting. So the doc, um, a lot of one of the things that I learned from the lawsuit is that um, the pharma already has written had ghostwriters writing the um, reports that were going to end up in some of the academic, um, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine and some of those journals. But they had to find a doctor, doctor, and it said doctor TBD. Well, that's because the industry writes them, they find doctors, they pay them to put their name on it, and then it looks like it's a doctor who wrote it. The marketing of it, um, very much target, you know, it's um, the cradle to grave, and really connecting stories of people who've been harmed. And I always say, we are considered acceptable collateral damage. Woody was acceptable collateral damage which was just a statistic, but acceptable collateral damage are somebody's husband, somebody's child, somebody's mother, somebody's sister. So it's really important that we understand how the system works um, so that no family at the end of the day should have to ask, how come we didn't know? You also bring up an interesting point, I think, Kim, about mass shootings, high-profile murders, suicides that so often make the news, but it's the guns uh, that are the problem. But I know some of your work centers around the medications that could also play a role. And for the most part, that's basically been ignored. Yeah, I think that's a really important one because every time there's another mass shooting, we keep going down the same path. More gun, you know, we got to get rid of the guns, guns, guns. But that is the low hanging fruit. So one of another document that was um, discovered or came out of the lawsuit was Pfizer helped to create a prosecutor manual in the 90s. Common sense would say, why would a drug company be involved? in helping to write a prosecutor manual that is used for people who use the, like the drug made me do it. Right. Or, um, so after, um, after the last, like, I'm so tired of it because until we start asking the tough questions about the drug, not saying it caused it, but we're not even curious about the link. So after the shooting in Parkland, Florida, um, I went down there and met with families and I brought the documents and I wanted them to start, you know, putting pressure. And I'm, you know, I don't know the legal ins and outs and how you can take it and actually take and sue these companies or bring these companies or bring this to light. But I do want this questions to be asked. And I feel like every single time there is a shooting, we should be, maybe there should be some kind of law that we should be, um, you know, lobbying for, which is, that their records, their medica- uh, medical records, their medication records need to be made public. Or maybe there's a certain type of thing that we should be um, demanding in any autopsies that we need to know if these school shooters and mass shooting, because we do know there have been people that have been tracking it. And almost a large majority of them have been on some type of um, psychotropic medication. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. If we're not asking the right questions, we'll never get the, the right answers. Uh, to fast forward, though, a, a bit now, you've been on the scene since day one advocating for vaccine safety. Take us back, though. You saw some red flags, you said, from day one as to how this was all rolled out when it comes to the COVID vaccine. Sure. Uh, so I've never personally been involved with vaccine safety advocacy up to this 2020 uh, because I, didn't, I don't have kids. And so I knew there were a lot of other people who done really great work in that space. I also have known, I also knew that it was kind of a really, um, I don't know, like name calling. It was a horrible place to be. I thought, you know, even in my space, it can be um, not a pleasant place to be. Mm-hmm. This was a whole nother level. That's right. a whole yeah. nother level. It's almost this like deep held beliefs that we can't even question. You know, we can question drugs, we can question dr- um, devices, but we can't question vaccines. So when the vaccine started coming out, the whole operation warp speed, and it was, um, they were going to be on the market within six months. And then we were like, all of a sudden, we um, weren't even considering any current drugs on the market that could have maybe helped. Um, Instead, they were all demonized. 
Um, people were told, the people who were sick were told, go home, come back to hospital. Then you start following the money, realizing that hospitals got money for, you know, if they have COVID with COVID versus of COVID, you know, deaths and if people are on respirators. And so then I saw the whole um, scaremongering of, of the media and the fact that this fast tracking um, six months or whatever it was that the placebo group of the people who are in the, um, in the trial were given, it was unblinded and they were given the opportunity to get the vaccine. I was like, wait, that's like a no, no in um, clinical, or at least I thought in clinical research, you got to keep your placebo group and your drug group so that you can have for measuring long-term safety efficacy, like there's a reason, especially when we had emergency use authorization. Then when you start even digging further in there, you're like, wait, these companies are getting complete legal immunity? Like they can't even be held accountable for this? And one of those companies was F Pfizer again. So yeah. that had to sound the alarms in your mind. Yep. So Pfizer, and I was like, well, and I know they've got a long history of how they've, um, you know, what they've done in in the system with other drugs and stuff. So then you looked at, there was no discussion of natural immunity, right? It was only going to be, we're only going to get out of this pandemic if people got vaccinated. Then it became everybody from celebrities and um, we're, you know, saying um, it's completely safe and effective. And I was like, since when is something brand new ever say completely safe and effective? Everybody knows that medical um, treatments and drugs have, um, some sort of, um, uh, you know, there's always risk associated. So for this to be told to the public, um, it's completely and safe and effective. And they were selling, you know, hope and, and, and getting back and saving grandma. And there was absolutely, the other thing I found fascinating is um, there was no debate. There was, it was just like science was settled. Science was settled and people who actually questioned and just asked questions even, you know, like I was just asking questions and I was attacked and, and, and all I was doing, like, cause we don't, there are so much that we don't know. We don't know long-term, you know, I know that like, you know, just look at what the antidepressants, it took 13 years before warnings got put on. Somebody knew about it. But so this idea that they're com completely safe um, and effective. And then obviously the marketing happened where it was like the first incentive I uh, remember seeing was, um, it was Krispy Kreme and you got a donut a day for a year. And I was like, are you kidding me? Is this like marketing or promotion? Or then it was like, come to the bar, get a shot for a shot. And then it was like, come to the baseball game. And it was all of these things are like um, a chance to win a million dollars in the lottery. You, you know, kids, you get $200 for a shot of an Amazon card. I was like, what is this? This sounds like sales promotion. And so all of that just started make me like, hold on, hold on. And then obviously, you know, fast forward, I knew I just had, you know, we, there was still so much we didn't know about it. Science didn't know about it, but then you started hearing about the injuries. And, and those injuries you, you covered um, at the state Capitol. I know Alpha News was there in April uh, to hear from, from some of these people who have terrible injuries associated with the, the vaccines. And this is kind of when you talk about you notice the difference in the media. This is These are people that you would take your messaging, take your story to before, but all of a sudden this side of things is not covered. The mainstream media, I was shocked from the beginning that the mainstream media has not been covering this or even curious because I look back at least with antidepressants and all of the drug safety stuff and devices, the media has been there. But on this, it was almost like they were just repeating what government was saying and that's it. And so I would call some of my contacts in the media and would be telling them, hey, we've got this press conference coming up at the state capitol, which you mentioned. We also did something in Washington, D.C., which is where I met, first really met a lot of the injured, including people uh, that were um, Maddie DeGary and um, Bree Dreesen. Both of them were in initial clinical trials from, from these um, vaccine manufacturers. And so I was trying to get my national media to show up. Nobody showed up, and it was all the alt press. 
So I go back to the uh, the Capitol conference that you were um, mentioning, and I saw what Alpha News did reported, which was an account of what actually happened. And then I looked at what the mainstream media who was there, um, I think it was the Star Tribune and um, one of the other um, uh, local newspapers and TV station. And it was claimed as a, it was deemed a anti-vaxxer event. I was like, wait, these are people that actually were telling their stories. These were injured people who actually did what the government told them to do because for whatever reason, whether they were mandated, whether they wanted to save um, and thought they were really doing their part and, and then to be called that they're anti-vaxxer, which actually makes no sense anyways, because they did actually get the product. So that doesn't even make sense. Um, But this idea of this gaslighting and, and telling the people who've been injured that it's in their head or they're um, complete, like they've created this, that families and communities are against them. And why are you bringing this up? I mean, it's horrible what's happened. And these are real, real injuries. And I think they're, it's growing by the day, but until we get somebody who's curious about, um, about wanting to know the injuries and, and dig into them. It still stems. I always say, even the FDA and looking at the all of what's happening at the VAERS system nationally, where's the curiosity? Where's the curiosity on the harms? The same thing they said to me when I brought Woody's story and there were all those other stories that came forward. Aren't you at least interested to know, like the NTSB, when a plane crash goes down, You go in and you look at everything. Aren't you just curious, like, why this is happening? And it's almost like blinders on, nope, we don't want to hear about it. And it's a shame. What final advice would you have for people when it comes to prescription medications or the COVID vaccine, for that matter, Kim? Well, I think first and foremost is do your research. um, And when you're, whenever something doesn't intuitively feel right, or you feel like you're being mandated, or you should be able to ask questions and you should be able to like push your doctors when they say something is completely safe and effective. I would ask them and say, well, prove it. Like, what does that mean? What do you know about long-term safety? Let's have that conversation. And even as more and more, which I do believe there will be more stuff coming out, just like the antidepressants, but it's the same thing we're hearing, which is, well, we don't want to scare people. But yes, you should. That is what informed consent is. And I think, um, especially in these vaccines, um, the the, um, COVID-19 injections, we need to know or people should know that you have no, you're on your own. If something happens to you, these companies have um, complete legal immunity. Um, and if you are injured, you're not even under the regular vaccine uh, compensation court. You're under a special countermeasure program that is, hasn't even paid out anything yet. And there's a lot of people that are on long-term disability. You know, I would ask if I had an employer that mandates it, um, I would ask, well, are you going to pay if something should happen to me? So I think there's a lot of questions that, you know, at the end of the day, you, people have to do what's right for them. And it's not saying do this, don't do that. It's our, it's our bodies. But I would always, whenever somebody says something is completely safe and effective, I would actually take, take a pause, stop, do some research, and then make your decision. And you've said you don't want other people to be in your shoes, that how come we didn't know? Yeah, at the end of the day, I, you know, it's why I keep doing this work, because it would be the easy thing to do is just to quit. But I wish that back in 91, when those hearings, that there was, that they were able to get those warnings on back in 91, when the initial happened, because I wouldn't be here today. But I know too much that I feel like it's not fair that I keep it to myself if there's something that could actually help somebody so they don't end up in the same place that our family did, which was completely blindsided because we blindly trusted and had faith in the system. 
I want to let our listeners know that you're on Twitter. Uh, they can follow you at Woody Matters. And again, the website is Kim Witzak. That is Kim, W-I-T-C-Z-A-K.com. Kim, we certainly wish you well with your upcoming projects. There are quite a few, I know, and the important work you're doing really for all of us. So thank you so much for being on today. Thank you so much for having me. And that will do it for this episode of Liz Collin Reports. We hope you'll subscribe on any platform you get your podcasts. And you can always watch our videos, too, by subscribing to our YouTube channel. Just search Alpha News on YouTube. We'll see you next time.